Good evening. It's good to see all y'all here. We got a good crowd. Y'all must have known I was singing tonight or something. I don't know what it was. Man. No, we, uh, I'm excited to hear uh, Brother Drake and Brother Nick talk about their trip tonight. We're going to sing a few songs to get out of the way and let them have it. Let's sing page 189. Let's sing the Lily of the Valley. Oh 
perfect solution for his embrace. been looking forward to this for the last couple of weeks and uh, mainly because I really want to hear about what it's like to travel across the world with Drake. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got to be an experience all by itself. <laughs> I'm pretty excited to hear from these guys. Y'all come on, Brother Dick and Brother Drake.
this is those are the altar baskets right there in that picture. Uh, made near about field dinner. With what little they had, they did the Lord. And it was just a blessing to see all these people. And they, there was probably 20 adults there too. Uh, just praising God. They sat there attentive and listened to what we had to say. And then when we asked questions, or when they asked, they asked questions, they had a little down piece of paper coming in. And we answered them the best we could, but some of that stuff was deep. It was it was trouble. Uh, uh, like, a kid around here would ask just silly little whatever. There'd be two or three of them. These kids turned in over 100 pieces of paper with questions that all. Some of them had two questions, or two or three questions per page. And, uh, just to hear them all stand up and sing. Like when, we, when we're singing on Sunday morning here, every, you know, some people will be standing there listening, some people will be listening. And then, but them, every one of them, all of them, was singing loud and dancing and clapping, and they all had rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> we, the three of us are standing there like, <laughs> that's right. And uh, the church, if you notice in a few of these pictures, there, the doors are open. And there's, there was one day we had lights on, but they didn't have air conditioning at all. It was the doors were open, which it was wintertime, so it wasn't hotter than there. But uh, they're playing soccer in that picture right there. But uh, they, it was, we sat in that church with the doors open. And, Um, there was people actually standing in the doorway because they run out of chairs. They would have the plastic lawn chairs, and uh, that was that's what the seats was in the church. And when we got done, they stacked them all up that night, and kids slept in the church because they it was too far of a walk to go home, and they stayed in the church every night in the of them. and they actually kept. Nick and Dustin up one night. I sleep like a rock. They kept them up at like three in the morning. Oh, praise God. Because they was right across the street from where we were staying at night. And uh, it, it was just amazing how all these kids, that's, they're wearing clothes that they've got Hollister and stuff written on them. But I, I'm near about guaranteeing you it's because people like uh, you who sent them clothes over there. I mean, and you see them, they're getting nailed. Right? <laughs> they, uh, they would come up in these different choirs. It was a um, youth, what was, it, uh, what was it, the thing called? It was a youth uh, function or something. But a conference, it was a youth conference. And there was a bunch of different churches came in. And the uh, choirs would come up the scene. And they would all of them, instead of, they had a piano there. But the first day we were there, we had electricity so they could play it. And their music, they stomped their feet and slid their feet across the floor and clapped their hands. And it wasn't just like rhythmic one, two, three clapping. It was, it had more than one beat going. And it just amazed me how they praised God. They moved, praised God more than just singing. They praised Him in a, by dancing, like David said. You know, dance. I mean, it's like more than, and they did that. They walked for miles to get there. Some of them, and dirty little kids, just covered, in just filth, <laughs> and they just loved it. They sat there and paid attention. It was amazing. And uh, we took a picture afterwards. They will be here in a second. Oh, hang on, this guy right here. I handed him my camera. Some of these, a lot of these pictures on here that, um, of the services. He took those pictures. He, he was one of the interpreters. And uh, this was on my camera when I got it back. <laughs> they was, he was a cool dude. And, uh, he's actually going to school right now, isn't he? I mean, he graduated from, from Bible college. They were real nice folks. They fed us breakfast and lunch and supper every day. Um, 
chicken and beef sausage. And it was it was good. It was the same thing every day. And you had to be careful how much you ate it. <laughs> but uh, it was, they passed out Bibles. My one of the, a lady from the church I grew up in said a uh, hundred King James or uh, New Testaments. With me. So we passed them out, and then some folks donated uh, Bibles in their language that they passed out to the churches in groups and soccer balls for each of the churches. And I'm talking about made people's day annual soccer balls. Right. Um, we don't realize how lucky we have here to be able to sit here in the air conditioning and we get to make up things to complain about. But uh, it was a very fun time I had but at the same time, it was it was something that I'll never forget. It was more of a blessing for me, I feel like, than it was for me. That's one of my seconds. That picture I'll be coming up pretty soon. This is all these kids, we took a big group picture. And here it is. You see me right down in the middle, squatted down. You can't hurt my... Yeah, you see all the hands on my head? I, th I was thinking, all right, I, I handed my, picture, my camera to the guy so he could take a picture. And I run back down there and squatted down so they could take the picture. And uh, all of a sudden, I felt the hand on my head. And by the time I got done taking pictures, they were sort of surrounding me, <laughs> rubbing my hair. <laughs> I guess it was so soft. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I stood back up and I reached and I rubbed one on the head. And another just showed my hand and said, hey, <laughs> pat me on the head. So I just sit there and we played it. Then uh, at that afternoon we went to the village and uh, looked around. They took us out and they said, let's eat in town. And I said, okay, we're going to get some nice, we're gonna, I'm going to experience some food that wasn't just, uh, just the same chicken we've been eating. And so we went to KFC. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, I went, it was, 20 something miles, but I bet it set in an airplane. We didn't get to see. <laughs> but that's what they wanted. Um, it was a fun time. That right there, you can see it good enough. That's a long truck. That's a bicycle with firewood stacked up on it. And they had racks built. It was head high, and then it come over the top of where the driver was. See the racks I threw on the bicycles, and they threw them up with logs and rode them wherever they were taking them. It was a long ways, I think, several miles. And uh, I guess that they sold them to make money. And we complained because we got to move something up in the back of the truck to take it somewhere. But that's about all I had. I mean, I appreciate your support and your prayers, and it was a blessing from God. I'm glad I went. I know He called me to do it. I would have chosen to do it on my own. It was 100%. The Lord was telling me to do it. And it definitely changed my perspective. But it's something that you just can't. You can't just see pictures of it on TV. Have folks tell you about it. When you get over there and see how happy these the people are, and realize that we're sitting over here and just making up stuff to complain about. It. But I appreciate y'all. Dustin emails Mark back and forth, 
It's usually three or four days for any response. Uh, Mark has set the, the dates for us, sent them to us. We bought plane tickets, and then he realized that we set it up uh, over a weekend, basically. He wanted it during the week, and so we got there, and, and he changed plans almost then when we got there, Mark did. And, and I knew we were going to speak to youth, but I didn't know a whole lot about what was going to be there. I knew the issues they wanted us to address, but, but uh, and I know Drake felt this way, but it really felt like we were flying by the seat of our pants the whole time. And it was because we were. We were trying to figure out what they needed um, uh, so that we could minister to them. Um, just to tell you a little bit about where we were and what we were doing, we were in Malawi uh, about an hour from the capital. Uh, the capital was a long way. Um, and we were there on behalf of Scotty McDowell. Many of you may know uh, Brother Scotty. He's preached some revivals around here. He's, he's a local guy. Uh, he does the uh, the artwork as he preaches. Uh, I know he's preached a revival at Perry. Uh, he was somewhere else around here not long ago. Uh, but Brother Scotty is is a uh, very humble, very devoted man. Twelve years ago, he actually slept on the ground where we slept in the building uh, when he started Rainbow, which is where we work. Uh, there's an orphanage there now, uh, holding about 60 kids. Uh, there's a school there. They've planted a church, and from that church, the pastor. Uh, Martin Bayway is his name. Uh, he's planted seven more churches in the local village. All from this uh, ministry started by Brother Scotty seven years ago. Um, Martin has also uh, made, the, made the Rainbow Orphanage uh, pretty well self-sufficient uh, by buying chickens. Uh, they used to buy eggs, now they have their own chickens. And they actually sell uh, their eggs uh, for money to the Bible College there, which is where he and, and the guy that, that took the close-up, his name is James, where they went to Bible college. James is not a pastor, but he is a, uh, a missionary, uh, so to speak. Uh, he goes into the, the hard places. He actually was telling us of a story uh, up in the northern part of Malawi where he was uh, standing outside sharing the gospel with this woman, and she ended up accepting Christ. But as he was sharing with her, her husband came home from the field and had what what's kind of like a bush axe, if you know what I'm talking about, a sling blade. Uh, and, and, and held it up to James and told him he was just going to kill him if he didn't stop talking. He said, I'm, I'm not going to. He said, I knew she was close. And so he didn't stop. And the guy got really mad and went inside. Came back out and said, you got five minutes and you better be gone. And in that time, this lady accepted Christ. James is very devoted. Uh, has very little. Uh, I've been in, in contact with him since. I mean, his brother loves the Lord. You know, like, like Drake was telling you, these kids came from all these different villages. They slept on concrete floors. They stayed up late, got up early. Uh, but they sang praise to the Lord. Um, it, it, was, it was just amazing to see. Uh, one of the guys that you may have saw, he had real colorful tennis shoes on. He had his foot up. He was singing. His name is Fallos. He was raised in that orphanage and has since surrendered to the ministry. He's going to go to Bible college in a year or two. Um, they're doing a great work. Um, and it's all in the name of the Lord. And the area is, is surrounded uh, by kind of witchcraft, witch doctors. Uh, witch doctors uh, are very prominent over there. And of course, Dustin, some of you probably met him at the Project 41 uh, deal. He cooked the crawfish. Uh, that's who Dustin was that went with us. Uh, he's, he's about this tall and our closest friend I got. And, and from the time we've known each other, I, 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 I guess I've always called him a little Mexican. And, and he calls me albino. <laughs> the joke over there was, was, was not funny because uh, literally if a child is born as an albino over there, he becomes funny. Um, the witch doctors in Malawi um, kill albinos and use them for their rituals. Um, if you, you can type in albino in Malawi on the internet, you can read hundreds of stories of, of babies taken from their moms, adults coming up missing, and all of them are killed and used in witchcraft. Uh, we were standing around one night uh, when they actually had electricity. Um, and you could hear something in the background. You kind of see a little glow. And, and I, I asked what that was. And, and Dusty said, that's a witch doctor doing a ritual. And, uh, and so I, I said something. And, uh, and one of the kids said, it's very bad, very bad. Uh, so bad they wouldn't dare go close. You know, we we kind of joked about maybe going over there. Uh, and they, they were, no, no, we're not doing that. We will not do that. Uh, it, it's a pretty wicked place, and, and God is, is is raising young people up right in the middle of it. And it's just exciting to see. It was very exciting to see people that had nothing, but they love the Lord. Um, 
the whole trip was full of big surprises and changes of what we were going to do. Um, that's, I guess that's just kind of Pastor Martin's way. Um, at the end of the, the thing, I think Drake mentioned we did a Q&A. The first question they asked us, we got totally wrong. We had no idea why they were asking. Uh, we kind of figured out when they laughed. That they actually asked us, is it wrong for guys to have uh, different haircuts? And, and of course, we all talked to each other and said, no, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But in their culture, there's very much wrong with that. And so Martin had to kind of correct us. And then all the kids thought it was funny because they knew they had tricked us into answering something that, that they, had been, they had answered a hundred times. So these kids asked questions like, uh, who is the Holy Spirit and what is his function in salvation? Uh, they asked questions about marriage. They asked some very uncomfortable questions about marriage. But we had to answer them. Um, they asked uh, questions about Adam and Eve, but, but they were very attentive, uh, very um, astute in what they wanted to know. Um, it, it was, it was as, as Drake said, a great trip. Um, it was a, a very fast trip. Uh, we traveled four days out of the seven we were gone. Uh, but uh, I feel like the Lord was, uh, was, was glorified. And his name was magnified among the nations. Um, They've already mentioned us coming back next year, and hopefully we can stay a little longer. Um, but uh, God's doing a great work over there, and I would ask every one of y'all um, daily to pray for the people in Malawi. Pray specifically for Pastor Martin. He's, he's doing a lot on his own, um, and he's, he's also a devoted husband and father. And so, so be praying for, for Brother Martin and Bayway, and for Brother Scotty as, as he goes over there yearly and helps minister to those people. Um, it, it, it's it's a, a harsh, strong reality, the lack of the gospel around the world. And in areas such as we were in, areas 100 miles from there may have never heard. And that's what this church is doing, is growing and expanding out, sharing the gospel. This gospel that, that has touched all of us. And, and I feel like in so many ways, a lot of times we just bottle it up. And, and I'm going to kind of use that to lead into what I want to share with you tonight. Um, First, I want to read a psalm that I'm sure you're all familiar with, Psalm 46. It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with their swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right over. The heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved, he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He maketh war cease to the end of the earth, he breaketh the bow, he cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. That rings true, not only at Antioch Baptist Church tonight, but at Rainbow Baptist Church in Malawi. A place where they worship with the lights off most of the time. It's, it's a very corrupt government. And so they use power kind of to control people. Uh, and by power, I mean literally electricity. They give it to you when they think you need it. Or maybe when they just want you to have it. Uh, it, it was crazy just that, that the lights would be flipped on by the government and off by the government like we flip on the lights with. That's what went on while we were there. And it took me a little bit to grasp what was going on. I thought maybe it was just weather or something happening. But no, it was actually the government choosing who had power at what time. But yet God still is their fortress, is their refuge, just as He is ours. Uh, there's something... That, that, and Reuben and I kind of, and I'll just share my heart with you a little bit, we kind of went back and forth with this. I, I don't like sharing, and this is me being honest with you, about what I've done. Because I know who I am. And, and I know I'm prone to have pride and, and want to boast. But the scriptures tell us in Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts Boast in this, that he understands and knows me. I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. 
And so there's always that fear, in, and I praise God, there's always that fear in me that pride will swell up. Because the Scriptures tell us don't boast in what we have or what we've done, but boast that we know Him. And that can be a little bit intimidating, right? Because there's so much to know, right? There's so much of this God that even, even those of us who maybe been raised in church since we were children, I bet there's some of you in here who have been in church for 70 years of your life. Yet there's still so much you don't know of the Lord. Yet the Scriptures tell us don't boast in your might, don't boast in your wisdom, don't boast in your riches, but boast that you know and understand the Lord. Now we cannot know God fully, but we can know Him truly. Praise God for that, right? We can know truly who God is by His Word. A.W. Tozer said this, it's not a cheerful thought that millions of us who live in the land of Bibles, who belong to churches, who labor to promote the Christian religion, may yet pass out of our whole life on this earth without once having thought or tried to think seriously about the being of God. Few of us have let our hearts gaze in wonder at the I Am, the self-existent self back in which no creature can think. Such thoughts are too painful for us. We prefer to think where it will do more good about how to build a better mousetrap, for instance, or about how to make two blades of grass grow where one grew before. For this, we are now paying too heavy a price in the secularization of our religion and the decay of our own lives. Tozer wrote these words, and they're so convicting to me. Does that make sense to you? That we would prefer to think about how to build a better mousetrap or how to make two blades of grass grow where one grew before before we would stop and think about God, the great I Am, the Creator and Sustainer of all of life. I have, in the last week, spent so much of my time thinking about how to run a more efficient business and not thinking about the God who created me and gave me the business. But yet the Scriptures still scream at us, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom mighty man boast of his might, the rich man boast of his riches. Let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me, the Lord God Almighty. Do we know Him? There's three things that I feel like we should desire. And that's to know His glory, to learn His Word, and to advance His kingdom. We can know God truly. We can know Him exhaustively, but that should not stop us from wanting to know Him. We can know about His power, His love, His wisdom, all of these attributes, His mercy, His grace, that He is abundant in steadfast love. We can know that He's holy. All of these attributes. Yet God is truly incomprehensible. You know, I've heard something my whole life and, and I, always, I always never thought a whole lot about people saying that. I just assumed it was true, but... But you've probably heard this. Well, we're going to know that when we get to heaven, right? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? I mean, I'm guilty of both. <coughs> and maybe we will. But we're not going to know everything. Do you realize that? When you get to heaven, you're still not going to be God? When we get to heaven, we're not going to know everything. That is how great He is. That we could live in eternity with the Creator of this earth, the Creator of our breath, every function of our crazy body that none of us fully understand, God created with His very breath, just speaking it and it happened. We will be with Him for a million years and there will still be more than a million years to learn more of Him. Have you ever thought about that? That's how great our God is. That this God who spoke and light came out, who spoke and the waters moved, who spoke and dust turned to man, who spoke again and, and rib was taken and woman was created. This very God knows the number of hairs on your head. This very God calls, the, it says in Isaiah 40, calls the starry host out and knows everyone by name. How many of you know the name of any star? Any of you? I don't want to be lying to say I did. I know maybe a couple of formations. God knows the name of every star. He calls them out and calls them by name. This is the very God who knows your name. But 
not the wise man that boasts of his wisdom. The rich man boasts of his riches, and the mighty man boasts of his might. Him who boasts, boasts in this, that he knows and understands me. And we get to know him through his word. Do, do you believe that? And we get to know God through his word. Like, we will all agree with that, right? But are we honest with ourselves? And maybe say, maybe we don't spend enough time in, our, in, in God's Word. And yet there's this call to know Him. People who are desperate to know God must be desperate for His Word, must be desperate for His Spirit. The question the kid asked was, was who is the Holy Spirit? And what is His function? Well, that's kind of a, a, a trick question because the, the Holy Spirit functions in a lot of ways. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws us. Who brings us to that point of regeneration, but the Holy Spirit is the one that walks with us and guides us along the way. The Holy Spirit points us to Christ, right? The Holy Spirit gives us understanding of God's Word. You can't pick up God's Word and it just enlighten you. The Holy Spirit has to bring that to you. So we must not only be desperate for God's Word, we must be desperate for God's Spirit. David Platt once said this, when we know God, routine religion is no longer tolerable. Routine religion is no longer tolerable. Yet I, I would dare to say that for so many of us in this nation that we call great, and it is great, have made religion a routine. And we do it because we're supposed to. And we're just checking a box to say we've done that. I'll be the first to admit there's been a time in my life more than once. Well, I've read my Bible because it was a box I needed to check on. When we know God and we know this God that created us, routine religion is not tolerable. We should not tolerate in our own lives making our religion a routine. <laughs> When we know God, casual worship is no longer possible. You cannot worship God without affection. I'm here to break that to you. You may believe you can, but you cannot worship God without affection. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 103. David says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like eagles. How can we claim to know this great God, yet worship Him like we are bored to tears? As Bodhi Bauckham says, if you can't say amen, you better say ouch. I have stood and watched people worship God like they are bored to tears. I have stood in the place and worshiped God like I was bored to tears. Casual worship is not possible when you know God. John Piper once said, missions exist because worship doesn't. We don't worship the God who made us. Do you realize that each and every one of you, He formed you in your mother's womb? He knows you. Isn't that great to say that He's my God? He's my God. He's good. He's mine. It's probably the thing that stood out the most to me as we stood in this church with no doors, the doors open, no lights, and kids walking around. They did this one song, and, I, and I, all I remember was they said Dose a bunch of times. And they would wave their hands, and Drake was trying to dance with them. <laughs> <laughs> and he did take his shoes off, Mom. I told him I was going to rat him out. Um, we were leaving the airport, and she said, Leave your shoes on, Drake. And so I'm ratting him out. He took his shoes off. And when he tried to kick the ball with his shoes off, he fell down. So he got what he deserved. But anyway, <laughs> they were singing this song. And so I asked Dustin, what are they saying? And he turned to me and asked Martin, what are they saying? And they said, I searched the world over. Found none like Jesus. Come on. Huh? I've searched the world over. I've looked here. I've looked there. I've looked here. I've looked there. And no one could be found like Jesus. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe that? Because I believe we are a people that search everywhere we go. We search at the Walmart. We search at the mall. We search at the Bass Pro. We even say really dumb stuff, and next time you hear this, you can tell them that Brother Nick, on whatever day this is, 28th of, of uh, August 2016, said it was dumb. We even say dumb stuff like, well, I sit on my deer stand, and that's my church. Come on. Don't quit on me. <clears throat> Search the world over, but still there's none that we can find like Jesus. And we have access to the throne room of our Father in heaven. They don't get any better than that. Not the wise man, most of his wisdom, the mighty man, most of his might. But him who boasts most in this, that he knows and understands it. When we know God, routine religion is no longer tolerable. Casual worship is no longer possible. And total, total surrender is no longer optional. realize how great God is? When we sing the song, How Great Is Our God? This is the God that deserves endless praises. One thing that I have just boggles my mind is that some of the, the mindless debates we get in. And I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with with having good discussions. But we debate, especially in the Baptist church, some of the stuff that, that does nothing but pull us away from the truth of who God is. I, I kind of believe Paul wrote Hebrews. We have absolutely no 100% concrete truth. People will debate that point over and over and over again. And almost get in fist fights over who wrote Hebrews. We'll go to Revelation and we'll try to figure out what does this mean and what does this mean. You know what Revelation means? Nick Andrews is going to sum it up for you. It means that Christ is coming back and we ought to go share the Gospel. Because everyone is going to face judgment. It's not meant to cause mindless speculation. It's meant to drive mission. That's what Revelation is for. Total surrender to this God is no longer optional when we see His greatness, when we see His authority, when we know that He is the one that made us. He is the one that sustains us. He could drop you dead right here. He could drop me dead right here in an instant. I don't know about you. That's the type of God I want to surrender to. When we know God, routine religion is no longer tolerable. Casual worship is no longer possible. Total surrender is no longer optional. And global mission is no longer negotiable. You hear what I'm saying? If you are a blood bought, born again Christian, it's not optional. It's not negotiable. You are called a mission. There are 3,000 tribes in Africa, most of which have never heard of Jesus Christ. There are 350 million Buddhists in Japan, Laos, and Vietnam who worship a big fat guy that sits as a statue. There are 950 million Hindus, most of which are in India, that believe in karma of all things. There are 1.3 billion Muslims in this world worshiping a false god, bowing at least twice a day. Way more devoted than most of us are. Yet worshiping a god that will bring them nothing but eternal damnation in heaven. They all need to know God. 42% of this world considered unreached. Did you know that? 42% of the world's population is considered unreached. Not unsaved, unreached. It means they've never even heard of the God who made them. 1 
1 Chronicles 29, 16. This is, O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. They build a house to the Lord. And they say all of this that we have built this house, house with comes from your hand and is your own. How are we doing the same? How are we taking what God has stewarded us and using it for His glory? And that's the ultimate question. I mean, I, I've been there. And I still find myself there clinging to the hope that this world offers. Clinging to the, the almighty dollar bill saying that this is mine. I earned it hard. No, it's not. It belongs to the Lord. Are we going to build His house with it? I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the bride. When you know God, global mission is no longer an option. It's not negotiable. You can't talk your way out of it. Every one of us in here has a mission to build. And it starts right where we're sitting. And you give them all. Ruben talked this morning about our families. And what greater mission field than our families than to share the gospel and leave that legacy of who Christ is. And teach them to teach others. It wasn't too long ago Reuben preached about Abraham and how he's a friend of God, right? God gave Abraham his blessing, and in that, Abraham blessed others. Are we doing that? so prone to want to take the blessing we get and hold on to it. It's not ours. It's His. We're going to pass it on. We're such a fortunate people. I, I believe Drake would agree with me 100%. We're such a fortunate people to live where we live. And we cry and groan constantly about this or that. And I'm saying we because I am guilty. This God was so great. And He created every one of us who was so compassionate and loving that He came, sent His Son down from His throne, who took on flesh, walked in our place, died in our place, and risen and sits at the right hand of the Father so that we can have eternal life. We're just going to sit on it. Hey, are we? I was talking in our class this morning, and it's been a conversation I've had quite a bit with some friends of mine lately. It is how our generation is a real big on these great declarations of what we're going to do, right? And, and we we say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to be better. And God just wrecked me with that sermon. And that's where it ends. And we stay focused on the conviction instead of the action that the conviction is meant to produce. And it scares me that instead of living our lives for the glory of the Father, we just want to tell people we're going to. Come on. You know what I'm saying. We're real big on talk. But there's no substance to it. We say this, this fire is just building up in me. It's got to come out. It never comes out. We talk about how God's moving us to do this. We're too afraid to do it. We talk about how people need to hear the gospel. That's the missionary's job. That's the preacher's job. No, it's your job. Every one of us is a born again Christian, is a missionary. Whether you want to hear it or not, you're either called to go down into the well or hold the rope. Either way, you're going to have burns on your hands. This God we have is so great. 
so magnificent, so wonderful. And yet he's ours. And he's calling us to not sit on that, but to share it with the world. How are we going to respond? Would you stand?